We're on. Okay. Nancy, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know in a second. Nancy Spann. Yeah, okay, Dave, go ahead. All right, I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the com complexes of playground for people who think. All right, first of all, let me acquaint you with some of our, our policies here. First of all, our rule is one fool at a time. Second, no personal attacks. That means you don't get to curse out the speaker. And that also means that you got to keep your voice down. We don't need to shake up everyone else here in the restaurant. All right. Next of all, there will be a $3 tuition charge that will be collected from each of you if the college may defray its expenses. Next, let me give it a second. Yeah. All right. Next, um, if we want to continue, we here, the restaurant's got to make some money off of us. So that in turn, that in turn means that you might as well take the time to order some dinner or I get something else to eat and or drink. All right, with regard to our format, first of all, we're going to have announcements. Charlie, our PAYOC, our coordinator, will lead off with announcements concerning upcoming programs. Then we will turn the floor over to any other announcements of neighborhood or community interest. No speeches at that, at that time, announcements only. All right, after that, we will introduce tonight's speaker, Nancy Spow, who's going to talk about Abraham, the Abraham, what every American should know about Abraham Lincoln. Then there will be questions and answers. This is, and she's going to talk for about an hour or so, give or take a few minutes. Then we're going to have questions and answers. That's right. And this is like Jeopardy. Questions must be in that forum. If you start giving speeches during that part of the program, somebody's going to start hollering at you, what's your question? Then finally, we do go to rebuttals. Tim, Tim, our moderator, will portion out the time per person. And you can talk for five minutes or so, whatever, whatever the time of it is, on any topic that you would like, or we would prefer that you would talk the speaker, but you don't have to do that. You can use your time any way that you want to. And then the speaker will get the last word. We close at like eight seven forty five. Yes, we close at seven. Yes, we will shut down the proceedings here at the restaurant at about a quarter to eight at seven forty five. So the restaurant will have time to clean up after we're done. The Zoom call will remain five. open. The Zoom call will remain open if they want to speak. Later. Yes, the Zoom will remain open to people who want to speak. All right. Charlie, take it away with the announcements of the upcoming. Oh, for a moment. All right. Go and you go next. Charlie, go ahead. Charlie, go ahead. Now, Andy, this got to be a community announcements. You know. By the way, this is for community announcements and announcements regarding the college. Charlie, get started. Okay, meeting number three thousand. Welcome to meeting number three thousand seven hundred and two. Of the college of complexes, the playground for people who think. Now, as usual, uh, I will notify you that we maintain a Google email group and a meetup group, which functions much in the same fashion. And you will see one or two emails each week on indicating the upcoming programs. That's very easy, it takes less than a minute to subscribe to either one of these or, or both of them. And I highly recommend it. Uh, the methods for doing so or the links are provided at the top of the main website. Let's see what else. Please, during the presentation, will everyone on Zoom put a bid reg X over your microphone so as not to interrupt our speaker. And I remind everyone in the restaurant that the the technology picks up idle conversations. So please maintain uh, uh, some measure of quiet during the presentation as well for those in person. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next week, February the 11th, 
Yours truly, Charles Paydock, will have a presentation on capturing the outlaw. Was there, in fact, a real Robin Hood? I looked at the sense of research to ascertain if there was a, a, a guy living in Sherwood Forest. I also did a two part program, and the second half is a look at individuals, activists, and organizations who have embraced the ideology of Robin Hood. Why has this legend endured? Was in fact a real historic personage or simply a legend? We will look at that. On the February the 18th, we will change to ecological topics. Two well seasoned members of the environmental community will give us an overview of the components of CJA. This is a major, major legislation that took place, was passed in the state of Illinois, singularly distinguished Illinois in many respects as a green state. And also there'll be information on how you can take advantage of some of the major components of CJA. So February the 18th, ecological <laughs> topics. On February the 25th, um, we were, it's an open date as well as March 4th uh, and 11th. So if you'd like to speak, I'm seeking someone uh, to speak on women's issues in conjunction with March 8th, International Women's Day. So if you know someone that can recommend, please forward an invitation on my behalf to them. So we have three days, the 25th, February 4th and 11th of March. On March 18th, we'll be looking at ownership issues regarding social media. This is certainly a hot topic as to what the broadcast content should be. There'll be plenty to discuss. Uh, Enrique Perez put together a program with his own recommendations regarding that. Uh, okay, I do a little more advertisements. We do maintain a lecture library of all previous present, almost all previous presentations. If, uh, and we also maintain another site uh, with PowerPoint presentations and free films and sundry items of general interest. So I check out either one or both of those sites in terms of community involvement. If you would like to be involved in the Green Party, there will be a, a meeting at seven o'clock of the Chicago and Cook County Greens. Green Party. So if you want information regarding that, please contact me. My email's on the contact info is on the website. Okay, Tim, take it away. We have a community announcement from Andy. Go ahead, Andy. It's it's just go ahead. an announcement and an update from uh, what Charlie just said uh, and uh, David said earlier. The rules of the college are one pool at a time and no personal attacks. Well, those rules were just laughingly thrown out the window last week. And this from is this a community Park. announcement, Andy? This is announcing you, Charlie. Just what is the community event that you are announcing, sir? All right. I'm gonna let him make us let him make us in the go ahead. It is not a community announcement. He should not be speaking. Uh, Charlie, 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 I won't be silenced on this. So, so just mute yourself for 30 seconds. Go ahead. What I'm saying is we're not going to allow a, a feeding frenzy attacking, verbally attacking any member of the college like what happened last week. We will mute anybody. And we'll just cut the Zoom off for two or three minutes right at the start. But we're not going to allow a feeding frenzy like what happened last week. So thank you very much. You don't Charlie, run the college, Andy. Uh, Charlie, let, let, let's. Uh, well, we'll, we'll. This is supposed to be community announcement. Right, if you can't chair the meeting, turn. Let Charlie, somebody one pool at a time. That applies to you too. All right, okay, go ahead. Any any announcements? Pro announcements? 
Go ahead and start right, our speaker. Go ahead. Well, let's let, okay, that's fine. Let's, uh, let's, right. let's get on now. Okay, All right. I'm now going to introduce tonight's speaker. Nancy Spanhouse is the author of, of two books, one on the um, political economy of the American Revolution and another on the a book on Alexander Hamilton. And she's going to talk tonight about what every American should know about Abraham Lincoln. So would you give it up, please, for Nancy Spanhouse? All right. Take it away, Nancy. Share your screen. Well, what do, what, you, what do I do? Just uh, just show your screen like you did last. Can I, I? It's been shared. It's underneath, but it's underneath your thing. But can uh, I just? I'll minimize it. Okay, yeah. fine. All right. You can't see it right now. It's I, I unshared it earlier. To get the oh, paper. you can't see it. Not now. No, you're gonna have to share it again. Oh well. I'm sorry. I don't know how to go back. No, just just go to the bottom of your Zoom. Your Zoom. Meeting. It's not showing. I because okay. uh, I did I did something else. Wait a second. You're, 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 All right, now I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Here we go. It looks like it's there twice. Yeah. Can we you see, see it now? Yes, we can. We're all okay. That's fine. And thank you for let's get your presentation started. Oh, okay. Fine. So it's. Uh, uh nice to be back with you i've i've spoken to you at least twice i know once initially on my book on my book initially on my book um hamilton versus wall street and then on nuclear power um and maybe there was a third time too but i sometimes get a little mixed up on my zoom presentations but tonight i want to talk about a man whom I've been studying and giving classes on and who is featured in Hamilton versus Wall Street as a follower of Alexander Hamilton, Abraham Lincoln. And of course, he's always been a figure of extreme controversy all the way up to today. Um, and my approach here is to take a look at three areas of his uh, of his beliefs and activity, which um, in some depth, which uh, based heavily not only on what he did, but also on what he said. And of course, if you've read any of the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, you know they're quite extensive and quite philosophical. Uh, and I don't believe myself that you can understand him without actually uh, going in depth into those uh, public into those speeches. So I'm uh, going to proceed in that way, um, and we'll see what you think. Hopefully, it will give you a something of a different perspective on what. Uh, uh, you thought that Lincoln thought uh, and what was behind what he did. So uh, let's see, this thing moves ahead. It doesn't seem to be doing. Okay, so the three major areas are his major political goal, which he enunciated as saving the union, his basic philosophy, <laughs> the commitment to the Declaration of Independence, and his economic policy, which is what I've mostly focused on in my writings. Uh, but uh, in the course of teaching these classes, I've gone in some depth into the other aspects of his life, which, and his contribution, which of course, to most people are the major elements of his contribution, because very frequently his economic policies we are not paid attention to. I gave, uh, Charlie was kind enough to send me three videos on Abraham Lincoln's life just last week. And as far as I can tell, none of them said a thing about what he did with the economy, which is actually rather shocking. So let's start with the political goal of saving the union. Now my assertion in terms of 
my work uh, in reading and study is that that goal, contrary to what many think, was inseparable from his idea that slavery had to be abolished, actually inseparable. And I want to give you something of the evidence for that. I think the best place to start is with his inauguration speech, which unlike his second inauguration is quite extensive. And as you know, at that time, secession had already begun. The war had not begun, but secession had begun. And uh, I think seven states had seceded. And Lincoln's view was that, that, that he could not accept that, that secession was actually uh, not permitted by the Constitution of the United States. And he makes the argument that in contemplation of universal law and of the Constitution, the union of the states had to be perpetual. Uh, now, partly of that is based on the fact that he didn't see it as a decision by the states to make a country, but by the people and through the activity of the people, which actually began long before the Constitution and even before the Declaration in terms of their uh, combination and activity vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mother country. But then he argues, and he argues at some length that it's impossible to break up the country in any way that is a viable, makes any part of it viable. Um, and then he makes the second argument, if, if one, if a number of states would be able to quit, that would violate the preamble, which said we, we aspire to be a more perfect union. And then he directly relates the question to slavery, that that is the fundamental problem that we have here. We have a disagreement over both whether slavery is right and whether it should be extended. Those are inseparable ideas, uh, and that is the basic dispute. And then, of course, he, he makes the, what is the usual thing that's quoted from this speech is the appeal to patriotism from the uh, Revolutionary War, trying to pull people together. I mean, he was very committed to the idea of the Union, but what kind of Union was absolutely critical in his mind. Now, he said there that the key threat was expansion, the belief in the expansion of slavery into the territories. And this, of course, is a major area of conflict um, that we've seen that we've seen in the in the Congress, um, and that led uh, directly to uh, major violence and to the Civil War, because in fact the uh, South was unwilling to accept a restriction on the expansion of slavery. Um, so this was uh, a, the key area which Lincoln initially, I mean, he did not yield a bit on the question slavery is wrong, but he believed at that time, and I think he always believed that the constitution did permit slavery to exist in the states where it already was. But he saw that as meaning it was if it was maintained within those states, that it would be on the road to extinction. That was the overall view at the time of the Declaration, at the time of the Constitution. And the desire to expand slavery was a violation of that initial commitment. And it was because of the threat of expansion of slavery, for example, that Lincoln in his short term in Congress, which was eight, between 1847 and 1849, opposed the Mexican-American War. That was not particularly a popular uh, uh, reaction to have, although he was 
hardly the only one, um, but uh, the Mexican-American War was indeed fought by a faction within the Democratic Party of the country for the right to expand slavery, expand it because Mexico had banned slavery uh, and Texas, which was under the jurisdiction of Mexico, uh, was uh, they wanted to open to slavery. So that was the key reason he opposed that war. And then he opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which of course brought that conflict, not just between Americans and Mexicans, um, but into a, into a quasi-civil war actually at the time of the 1850s. And once again, he's talking about the conflict being a violation of the fundamental ideas on which the country was based. Um, the, we, are, we are violating the spirit of the revolution to do this. Uh, slavery itself is a violation of man's uh, nature. And the question is, is the Negro a man? And if that's the case, then which in fact the constitution does ratify, it never says that a slave is property. Uh, it says that he, he talks of persons, not of property. Uh, in fact, there was a vote in the Constitutional Convention to try to talk about slaves as property. It was defeated. So he again says, let's stop what has lately happened, which is claiming slavery is a moral right and say it can exist where it was at the time of the Constitution and let it uh, be on the ultimate he says in another place, the ultimate road to extinction. And this is the basis on which we will save the union and make it worthy of being saved. Obviously, the conflict accelerated after the Kansas-Nebraska Act um, and Lincoln accelerated his attack on the on the policies of extension of slavery, which he believed along with many uh, was actually threatening to ban the abolition of slavery. Um, there's a very detailed argument of that that he makes in the course of discussion uh, in the next subject with, with, with uh, Stephen Douglas. But you're all familiar with this element of the House Divided speech um, where he makes it clear again that slavery has to be confined to those states where it was previously uh, and it has to be on the course of ultimate extinction. This was always his commitment. Uh, and the means by which that could happen uh, was questioned, but the goal was absolutely uh, fixed in his mind. Now, Lincoln was very much aware throughout this entire process that this was not simply a domestic question, whether the union would survive, whether they, it was permissible and uh, to allow a section of the country to secede because the United States existed in the middle of a world of empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, um, and they were intimately involved in the Russian Empire, intimately involved in uh, 
the outcome of the conflict here in the United States. Um, the British role, which Lincoln was quite aware of, he was in fact blamed British intervention for the Polk victory in 1840 uh, as president. Um, the British role was uh, two-faced, was two-sided. Um, on the one hand, the British were taking great advantage of the fact that they had banned slavery officially in their colonies in 1833, actually 1843, uh, in areas of the um, uh, East India Company, but uh, made a big deal that they wanted Texas to be a free state and so forth. But, so they were pushing that, uh, I believe from the standpoint of dividing the country because at the same time, they were the major financial backers and purchasers of slave cotton in the South. Um, and they were uh, therefore the major underpinning of the slave system at the same time that they were saying they were against it. And going up into the Civil War, um, it, it was clear to them that they would like to see a breakup of the United States. Um, they would like to see it divided because if it were not, um, it was potentially an economic threat on the global scene. Um, and there's quite significant evidence of that. There was in Britain, um, what you hear mostly is about their sympathies with um, the anti-slavery movement, but right up there at the top of the government, people like William Gladstone, allegedly very anti-slavery, uh, were agitating for British support, explicit support for the uh, Confederacy. And in fact, de fact, I mean, in reality, the British did support the Confederacy. Uh, they built this, one example is building this ship, the USS Alabama, or what well, couldn't have been the USS, it was the US something else, Alabama for the Confederacy. And they uh, acknowledged the fact that they did that. Uh, they paid reparations later on to the United States after the end of the war. There was also the French, and the French were heavily involved in trying to expand, support the Confederacy, and, and be involved in an expanded slave empire uh, that would include Mexico. Mexico, as I said, had already abandoned, uh, abolished slavery. Uh, the French wanted to see it reinstituted and there was an invasion of Mexico, it was actually not just France, it was also Britain and some other country uh, for debt collection. And then the French decided to stay and try to conquer it. Um, and their intent was to uh, use their victories in Mexico to provide support, military, you know, tangible support to the Confederacy. Uh, the famous Cinco de Mayo, is the Battle of Puebla in 1862, uh, where miraculously, basically, the Mexicans defeated the French uh, and therefore prevented the, the French from carrying out that significant support of sending arms to the Confederacy. But that was a, a major threat. The, you know, Lincoln was later quite aware of it. Uh, but he was a man who was aware of the international situation throughout his political career. Um, and, and the other thing that was quite clear to Lincoln uh, throughout the entire period of his political life prior to his becoming president was the fact that there was a whole section of the Democratic, the Democratic Party related uh, groupings who were agitating to ex to use not necessarily with foreign with uh, French in terms of the French, but were agitating to have the United States invade Cuba, uh, invade Mexico, and create a huge uh, 
new slave empire all into South America. Uh, and they carried out what was called filibusters. Before filibuster was a discussion of what went on in the Congress, it was a discussion of military units. And they literally trained military units and tried to carry out invasion of, an invasion of and takeover of Cuba. I mean, the Bay of Pigs was not an original idea. Um, it actually went on back in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and Lincoln on the campaign trail throughout his political career was blasting these guys for uh, that kind of foreign intervention, partly because he didn't believe we should have foreign military intervention at all, but even more significantly because its aim was to establish a slave empire. So this was a, another aspect of what he understood the breakup of the Union would actually enable. Uh, the South being able to split off would be in league with these foreign forces and establish, not see slavery diminish, as some have argued in recent years, that the British would have gone ahead and eliminated slavery, but in fact led to an expansion of a slave empire throughout the Southern Hemisphere. Now, one of the major arguments that is used to say that, uh, that Lincoln saw the Union and the defeat of slavery as two separate issues um, was this letter he wrote to Horace Greeley in August of 1862. Um, but in fact, before, a month before he wrote that letter, he had already decided, made a fundamental decision. Whereas before he had felt that it was necessary to uh, respect the initial constitutional decision that slavery could exist in the states where it was, um, he decided that the constitution itself would be destroyed, the union would be destroyed if that situation was allowed to continue. Therefore, more aggressive action had to be taken to end slavery um, from the federal government. And that was done with the Emancipation Proclamation. And he decided that on his own and announced it to his cabinet in July 22nd, 1862. This was sort of a revelation to me. Um, he said, I don't, you can give me your opinion, but I've made the decision. It's gonna happen. Uh, I don't know when exactly it's gonna happen. I'll have to time it, et cetera. But, you know, and I'll let you say your piece but I've decided this. So that already uh, prior to this famous statement about, no, oh, he doesn't really care about slavery, Lincoln had put himself on this course. So to conclude this section, Lincoln believed that there was a fundamental commitment in the Constitution of the United States that required moving to the abolition of slavery. That was an integral part of the union, the union that he wished to save. Now the second uh, which area that I wanna discuss is commitment to the declaration. Well, this of course is a major matter of debate these days, you know, was the declaration of total fraud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this indirectly, addresses that question or actually directly addresses that question. So now my view of the declaration and it corresponds with the way that Lincoln used it. I don't know whether he would put it this way is that it really has three parts. It has a declaration, it has like a preamble declaration of principle. The major point of it being this, uh, it has the statement of uh, crimes, so to speak, and then it has the uh, implementation of what the what the uh, states are going to do. So, 
This is the essence, however, and this is what Lincoln concentrated on as the essence of the Declaration. And his commitment to this is absolutely stunning in my view. This is his speech in Philadelphia on the way to the inauguration uh, in 1865, um, where he's in Independence Hall and he's reflecting on the significance of what happened there. And he's saying that he never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration. But he goes on from that uh, to say as well that what's involved in the Declaration was not just a matter of separation of the colonies, but it was a great principle. It was a principle uh, that was applicable not just to the people of this country, that he hopes to people of all time. And then he concludes by saying that it's on this basis that the country has to be saved. And I, I ask you to, to take this in. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Um, if it cannot be saved upon that principle, it'll be awful. If it cannot be saved without giving up that principle, I was about to say I'd rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender that principle. Now, to elaborate, uh, the, the Lincoln's view that the, and, and mine in fact, that the declaration is incompatible with the continuation of slavery. Now he comes to this with a history, obviously. Uh, one of the aspects of the history, which many people may not be aware of, is that his family was actually anti-slavery. Uh, they belonged to a small anti-slavery church when they lived in Kentucky, which is the first nine years of Lincoln's life. Um, the, uh, that view uh, Lincoln continued to have and his first protest against slavery was in 1837 uh, when he was a state legislator. Uh, and this was at a time when there was increasing violence uh, between, but not just I mean, partially racial violence um, with, of uh, people, abolitionists against slave proponents, but it was also violence against uh, immigrants and so forth and so on. So um, the, uh, but he and legislators around the country were saying, including in Illinois, which really was always a, a fight over whether slavery would be implemented or not, despite the uh, Northwest Ordinance, there was always a fight. Um, he said that uh, there was a resolution that was passed by the legislature condemning the abolitionists, saying that, you know, you've seen it before. <laughs> All this conflict is because these abolitionists are interfering. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, so we have to condemn their interventions causing the violence. And Lincoln didn't sign that. And with two or three other people, he issued his own statement saying that well, yeah, you know, he agreed to criticize you know, when they go beyond bounds, but the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy, uh, and there that has to be the fundamental stance. Now, as I, you know, we went through the the Peoria speech prior to that, uh, you know, that was part of his history which is that around the time, 54, it's around the time that, that the slavery issue really becomes uh, his major calling card. Um, and then things escalate further with direct relevance to the Declaration of Independence uh, with the Dred Scott case, because uh, that 
in the course of that case, uh, where he's saying that he should be a free man because he moved to a free state, and being in a free state means that he cannot be enslaved. Um, the Supreme Court, Tani, went beyond the question before him and made broad sweeping statements that in fact uh, violated what Lincoln considered the fundamental premises of the declaration, um, that it was impossible for anyone who's an African, someone of the African who's, whose history was as a slave to be a citizen, and that Congress has no authority to rule over the territories. That being rescinding the Missouri Compromise, basically rescinding the Northwest Ordinance, you know, rescinding the entire tradition uh, that had been in place up to that very time. So that directly called for Lincoln's response, and he definitely did respond. And this I consider to be one of his major, one of his clearest statements uh, on the Declaration because he indicated that, you know, what Tani was saying was what Blacks were not included in that statement of principle, that all men are created equal. And he said, no, and he says it again and again and again over the next period, and we'll go through a bit more of it. It is intended to include all men. Obviously, they weren't equal in many respects, but they were equal in certain inalienable rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They had no power to do you know, create the situation where that was the, true, but they declared it so the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances would permit. And that is his firm belief. Now, this was debated uh, you know, even more extensively, of course, in the seven Lincoln-Douglas debates. If you've never read those debates, I highly recommend it. The whole subject is the Declaration of Independence, with Stephen Douglas saying, you know, uh, there was no intent to give uh, any acknowledgement of humanity uh, to the Black population. Lincoln saying, no, um, our principle is a different principle. Uh, and this is his final summation of what is really at stake uh, in his debate with Douglas, uh, who's a Democrat, by the way, want to dehumanize, take him ever right, striving to be a man, make him property. And he acknowledges that the Blacks are being treated as property, but there has to be a pathway to, and it was determined there be a pathway to uh, full citizenship. Um, and that the real question is the principle, is it right or is it wrong? And that is something that, I mean, he has this just tremendous attacks on Douglas for saying, Douglas says, well, I'm not for slavery, you know, uh, but Lincoln says, well, you know, I'm neutral in the question of how it turns out. Lincoln says, you can't be neutral in how it turns out if you're really against slavery. Um, all you're doing is defending those who are for slavery. Hardly gives me confidence that you're really against it. Uh, and then he goes, do it, does it again uh, in a more lawyerly and actually somewhat uh, boring manner. Uh, but important. Uh, he's a lawyer, after all. Uh, and the Cooper Union speech, the famous Cooper Union speech of February 1860, where he talks, where he goes through vote by vote in the Confederation Congress and in the early Constitution about how many of the founding fathers opposed 
you know, believed and voted that the federal government had power over slavery in the territory and exposed, opposed its spread beyond the states where it already existed. Uh, and that is uh, a, one of the bedrocks on which he runs his presidential campaign. When he signs the Emancipation Proclamation, um, this I consider very moving as well. Um, he did it there, as you know, it was pre-announced in September um, and that it was gonna happen on January 1st, 1863. And he, um, and there were watch parties all night before 1863 and people were waiting and waiting and waiting, this is gonna happen. Um, and Lincoln spent the whole day having open house at the White House, shaking hands. <laughs> um, and uh, by the end of the day, his hand was apparently shaking, right? According to those who wrote about this later. And they said, uh, Lincoln decided that he had to, he was supposed to sign it, that he had to wait. He had to steady his hand because if, he said, if my hand is shaking and my signature is shaky on this document, people will think I didn't really mean to do it, you know, that it was somehow uh, something that I had locked myself into and so forth. But I never felt more certain I was doing right. Uh, this is on which I stake my whole soul. And he did other things beyond simply that. Uh, the ones I will mention is he did approve the uh, issuance of 40 acres, later also and a mule uh, to blacks on the uh, Georgia and North Carolina, South Carolina coasts uh, in the course of the war, which was attempted to be made into a policy of land sharing throughout the South, but uh, unfortunately, that got rescinded by Jackson, um, by Johnson, excuse me. And then he personally put his uh, power behind the 13th, passing the 13th Amendment, banning slavery. Um, that was, uh, took a long time. It was first introduced in the House in December of 63. Uh, and didn't pass until January of 65. But um, Lincoln campaigned on it in the election campaign of 64. Uh, and I think the movie on that, the movie Lincoln is quite accurate in terms of the machination, machinations involved. And then, you know, the, what allegedly was the final trigger for the assassination his statement about moving to give the vote. Um, now, all of this occurred in the context as well of a relationship he had with Frederick Douglass. And there's, I have some of the material on Frederick Douglass in the, uh, on the blog, if you're interested. But here, uh, he met, only met Douglass three times, um, but, uh, and you know, two of those times, Douglas was uh, basically very angry at him when he went into the meeting about how slow he was uh, acting on equality for blacks in the military, on moving for the right to vote, and so forth. Um, and you know, each of those first two times, he came out of those meetings backing Lincoln um, because uh, one thing I didn't put here is, um, I mean, this is a, his a final evaluation in, in a Cooper Union speech in June 18, 1865, which was a day of memorial for Lincoln nationally. But he also said it in an, another uh, speech that he gave, uh, at the moment, I'm not absolutely sure which one it was uh, on Lincoln, where he said, 
again, you know, Lincoln was a white man's president. And, you know, I got very uh, distressed with how slowly he was moving in the direction of freedom. But when I think about it, uh, it occurs to me that he had to move slowly, perhaps, because he had to bring the country along with him. Um, and therefore giving him time to bring the country along with him uh, was necessary. Sort of an interesting view. Now, the other aspect of Lincoln's uh, commitment to the Declaration of Independence was uh, his seeing that in the context of the role of education, because you know how can all men be create be equal if they don't have the opportunity to improve themselves by educating their minds? And Lincoln has an extraordinary record of making education at the forefront of his political campaigns. First, in his first one, the advancement of education. Uh, following this violence uh, in the 1830s, he speaks to uh, a young man's lyceum in Springfield, where he also talks about, well, how are we going to get out of this? How are we going to resolve these conflicts in our country? This is a document that I also highly recommend that you read. There's much more to it than I'm saying here. But what I want to say here is his emphasis, well, how are we going to, how are we going to restore our unity around principle in the country? Uh, the founding uh, generation is dying out. Uh, there are, we know ambitious men are going to be coming forward. You know, how are we going to uh, come through this and, and save our re democratic Republican institutions, it's gonna take reason. We're gonna to have to develop reason. Uh, and that is gonna take education. And he makes this presentation also uh, in 1859. This is at the Wisconsin State Fair uh, where he is directly attacking the Confederate, a Confederate uh, senator or a proto-Confederate senator uh, who made a speech saying, you know, we're so lucky here in the South. Every Is anybody working on her signal? Yes, I am now. Uh, I think she may have a. Uh, I think she may have uh, muted herself. I'm gonna, Nancy. Uh, I, I think um, we may have uh, um, had some trouble with with her signal. I'm gonna, Charlie. Can you call her up real quick on the phone and let her know to re-log in? She, we lost her signal. Charlie. Yeah. I think she's aware well, of her. Well, I, I I know we were um trying to get in here, but anyway um while we're waiting, uh, I don't know what happened. I think she just lost her internet connection. We're we're still good here. I take it correct. I'll see if I can reach her real quick on the phone. Hang on. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to call her real quick. Uh, Charlie, you have her number there at all or not? I'm looking it up. Okay, because I've got her website up now and I'm trying to trying to find it real quick. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't know. I think uh, American System Now is her, her website, and uh, I'll try to call her real quick. We'll, we'll, we'll be all right. Um, give us about two to three. Try to get her uh, up here. Uh, uh, I, I can't find it, Charlie. You you got her number still? Charlie, are you there? I'm trying to find it. Okay, hang on. Um, all right. Whilst we're waiting, um, has anybody ever been to the Lincoln Museum at all? Springfield. Yeah, it's Springfield. Why don't you go give us a few words on what it, what what it's like being there at the museum, real quick? While we're waiting for Nancy, come back. Um, I'll give you the mic, and uh, just go ahead and tell us about visiting the American Lincoln Museum, real quick, David. Go ahead. Uh, we're going to have David uh, tell us real quick what, what about the Lincoln Museum and uh, about what it's like. Let me make sure you're on. Okay, can you can you test the mic out? Yeah. Okay. The Lincoln Museum, as I, I haven't been there for a couple of years, but it's a, it's a fascinating place. There's one of those. Yes. We, we have a message. Go ahead. Nancy is my sister-in-law, and I just called, and they blew a fuse in their house, and they're replacing it. They should be back online very shortly. Okay, thanks, Paul. You mind if uh, Dave just gives us a little brief overview of the Lincoln Museum real quick? Thank you for letting that no. go. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, David. And tell them about it. All right. There's an audiovisual presentation in there. We're looking through a window from the auditorium into Part of the library where there's a librarian who talks about some Abraham Lincoln, and all of a sudden he, he turns into a Union soldier. And the smooth trans is very smooth, and you don't realize it until it's actually happening. It's it's absolutely wonderful. And they have many other exhibits in Abraham Lincoln's life and career. And they also have an excellent gift shop, too, for whatever that's worth. And if you have never been to Springfield, if, you, if that's the only thing you spring you see in Springfield, I recommend that you see that. Uh, and yes, I've also been to President Lincoln's home and some of the other stuff that's down there. It's, Springfield is really quite a place, and so is um, the Lincoln Museum. Go ahead, keep talking, Dave. I don't have much else to say. It's, well, give me, that, give me the mic. Okay, um, hang on. Oh, this is the movie. Yeah. Is it the movie that's starting? Yeah, I, I understand. Okay. It's not a movie. Anyway, um, what I'm going to do until Nancy comes back is I'm just going to show you a little bit about the, the Lincoln Museum, if you guys don't mind here. This is where I'm doing it. I'm going to share my screen real quick. And uh, this is the website of the uh, museum itself. Uh, six months of age and older, you know, they have a lot of, of, of neat stuff here at the, at the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Museum. Um, you, can, you can see everything about his life. They have several uh, interactive things as well as, uh, you know, recreations of the First Lady's Gowns for all you women out there who want to know what it's like. Um, the one thing I do know is that if you take the train down to uh, Springfield, you can, it's just about a half a block walk to the Lincoln Museum, which means you could def definitely take Amtrak down there. And I, at one time I did do it, you can pick it up to the train in Chicago at about uh, maybe seven something, and then be down to Springfield by about not by about 11. Take, take, go to where the Lincoln Museum stops, you can be back in Chicago by eight or nine o'clock. Um, and the thing that I want to tell you is that, you, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, people going into the Lincoln Museum. Uh, they have a lot of various events, things like this. You can also have a wedding there if you wanted to. But there's there's a lot of um, good Lincoln quotes. 
research and collections they got, oral histories, research divisions. It really is a neat place. I've been there twice. I haven't been there since about 2009. But I will tell you, there's one hall in there is where there's a bunch of political cartoons for Lincoln. And uh, you'd be quite surprised. I'm going to pull up their YouTube page real quick just to show you what uh, they can they, they can do over at this place. And like I said, we are still waiting for Nancy. And we're just trying to do a little fill in here real quick. And I think she'll be back online fairly soon. But uh, I don't know if we can keep this uh, up or not. Um, but we, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out here in a minute. Uh, Lincoln Library, Presidential Museum, Gettysburg Address. Uh, and there's also, too, if you want to see some of the recreations of the Lincoln Douglas debate by some good reenactors, C SPAN has a good site that. Uh, they actually, when they had the, uh, uh, the, the, the set, I'm not sure, I think it was 125th anniversary or something like that. Because I remember back in 1994, they were doing a series on the Lincoln Douglas debates and they actually went, C SPAN actually went and taped a few of them with professional reenactors. And I'll tell you, I was there at one of them that was out in, um, I, I forget what the name of the town was, but it was West of Rockford. Um, but it was really pretty decent. Um, and you can see here, just watch for a minute as, as, as the Gettysburg Address is delivered here real quick, if I can pull it up. It might take a minute or two here, but uh, it was... I'll get it here in a minute. I gotta... Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We've come to dedicate a portion of that field to the final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot have all this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, who consecrated it. Anyway, I think you get the idea. I'm going to, I'm going to minimize the screen. I also want to show you some of the resources you can find. I'll, I'll, I'll get this uh, stopped here. Because while we're waiting again, I'm going to show you where you can find um, the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, uh, itself. Um, you can uh, find them. Let me see if I can just get up here real quick. Uh, it's at the cspan.org website. Uh, it takes, okay, well, like Ernie's back. And like I said, I know we lost our speaker for a few minutes while she's getting her views fixed. So we're going to try to uh, um, show you where you can find the actual speech of the Lincoln Douglas debates. And we have to go back to uh, C SPAN here. Come on. Okay, there we go. Uh, um, C SPAN has quite an extensive video archive. We're just hiding in the rock, like. You know, we're trying our best to do it. Now, if Nancy's back, we'll be have her back go back in. But uh, if you go to, uh, for example, you can. Oh, come on. 
Search on that little quick type for C SPAN, you'll be able to find quite a bit of them on here. As you can see, the 1994 Lincoln debate reenactment, they have quite a few on here. The one I intended was in Freeport, Illinois. And uh, you can find out quickly that you can, you know, it's, it's all for free and it's all there, but you can find it in there. And it is a really good um, debate. And, uh, and you can see it there. That's just one resource. Plus, you know, I'm sure all of you guys know how to do Cooper Union and all that other good stuff. All right. Anyway, um, who else has anything to say about Lincoln here in the audience that they'd like to share real quick? We'll wait for the, uh, uh, okay, Charlie, go ahead. I'll, I'll stop. We can, we can rant for Senator. He actually didn't have much of a political career. He had four terms in the Illinois State Legislature and one term in the U.S. Congress, 1846 there, uh, he was in opposition to the Mexican War, which was not a popular position at the time. And he was running for senator in those days. The senators were selected by the legislature or the government of the state. Uh, Douglas won 54 to 46. Charlie, you up. Uh, Charlie, your internet connection has been rather spot. Your internet connection is rather spotty, Charlie. So I'm sorry we're having trouble hearing you. Really? Okay, we're good. I can hear him fine. Okay, good. Go ahead, Charlie. Finish off. Well, he, Douglas won 54 to uh, 46. Now, Amazingly enough, Lincoln ran for president on the basis of his photograph, it's alleged. <laughs> he had his photograph taken 130 times. And in those days, you didn't actually do campaigning for president. But they were very careful in the media use uh, of his, so he looked presidential, so to speak, or what they thought at the time. But yes, I used one of the photos from the campaign on the uh, announcement for this event. But uh, yeah, it, it's alleged that he secured the presidency on the basis of his photograph. Uh, okay. The convention, he was aided by the fact that the convention of the party at the 1860 was held in Chicago. Uh, they planned it very carefully to win the nomination, which obviously succeeded. Uh, there were splinters among the other parties. They split the ticket. So uh, I don't believe he achieved the majority of the votes popular vote. Nevertheless, he succeeded in becoming president of the United States. Um, okay. Um, Douglas, Douglas, amazingly enough, we have debates here about campaigning for president. Douglas was actually criticized because he somewhat sensed he wasn't going to win and he actively campaigned in those days. Uh, actively campaigning for president was discouraged and frowned upon. Who was the first active presidential campaigners, Charlie? Well, Frederick Douglass and Abe Lincoln and I forget who the third party candidate was. I thought there was four parties running the know nothings and something else. I don't know any. Uh, somebody I'll else like perhaps that. know more. Was it the first real active presidential campaign done around the 1890s, though, I think, by train? Well, that's whistle stop campaigning. There are all sorts of campaigns 
until prior to that, um, parades and things like that, local politics. No, there were, there were, I mean, you're talking about campaigning by railroad, uh, that relatively recent event. Okay. All right, what we're gonna do now is uh, go on up and up here and we'll go into a pretty brief, if, if you got something to say about Abraham Lincoln, all right, we'll go into our, our rebuttal period for temporarily until Nancy comes back. And if I not, just, I wanted to add that if anybody's going to Springfield, um, there are two, two, two things to look for in the railroad uh, schedules. Yeah. Now, there are routes that are strictly Illinois. Um, and going south is not a problem. But coming home, there's routes that are strictly go within the state of Illinois. And then there's routes long that are long long term routes. What's their speaker down there? That are headed into Chicago, the Texas she, Eagle. She was at her house. I, I would well uh, I would recommend don't don't book the Texas Eagle because that's a train coming all the way from Texas and very often can be late by several hours. So if you're coming home from Springfield, try to log in on an Illinois, a route that runs internally within the state of Illinois is okay. what I'm recommending. All right, Charlie, what we're gonna do now is we're, uh, since we've lost our speaker, I'm gonna now go into our official rebuttal period. We'll give each of you guys about four or five minutes to go ahead and we'll start here with the, uh, we'll start here, go up front. We'll give you the microphone. You sit down in those two chairs there and we'll get you right up and ready to go. We don't have our podium because it's broke right now, but we will just stay right there and use the microphone. And uh, you want to sit down in between the two of them and just go ahead. We'll get you right there. And, uh, all right. What do you think? Is the so, on? Uh, so, I think I think Nancy's back now. I think. So hang on. Well, if you give me one minute. Turn turn on the mic. I'm supposed to give you one minute. Okay. Okay, I'm back. We're, we got one guy wants to give a quick one minute. Go ahead. Uh, about Lincoln, there's a big question. It hasn't been addressed very often, but I often like to think in my own mind. Uh, Lincoln had a choice when he took over the presidency. And what he did was he craftily maneuvered the South into firing the first shot of the Civil War against Fort Sumter. He didn't really have to do that. He could have maneuvered things in a way in which he still tried to keep the Union intact without uh, precipitating so much carnage. And afterwards, he, of course, uh, was very, very disappointed in himself. And in some cases, some people say, some historians think he was fatalistic. He almost willed himself to get assassinated. He almost thought that he, had, he was so guilty of the Civil War and all of that that uh, maybe he deserved. But that beside the point, the question remains, um, was Lincoln really a statesman or did he help precipitate the Civil War? Because he could have taken additional steps to maybe um, uh, mollify the South enough to keep them going um, because they could have argued amongst themselves in the South that, well, if we can survive four years in the Union with Lincoln, we don't have to really. Even though you know South Carolina had seceded, that's true. Several states had seceded, but they not could have just been, not just that, South Carolina. That's question okay, for hang thought. On. Okay, yeah. question for thought. All right, questions for okay, Nancy, go ahead again and uh, can I can I do the last part? I'm really sorry about this, well, but Nancy, we understand a blown fuse. Yeah, fuses happens. Technology goes in. As you can see, we were kind of lively while you were gone. So I, I can see, I can see. Uh, you know, I want to do the I want to do the economic part next, and then uh, and then we'll then we'll go into questions, and then, then we'll, we'll go into uh, the things. So let me share the screen. Okay. Glad to see you're back, though, Nancy. Well, I'm glad to be back. I mean, it's very frustrating, but okay. Yeah, but it happens. So yeah, I know. Okay. Let me see if I can get to the. Just go right, right at, right at, right at the top there. Uh, uh, I've got to get to the slideshow. You're from, on the slideshow. From the screen. Right, and then just go where you're right there. Okay, sure. All right, so part three, which I think people are very unaware of, as I said, uh, which is 
the uh, economic policies of Abraham Lincoln. So just to- Oops, Nancy, my fault. Unmute, please. I, I, may, I had, there we go, sorry about that. Okay, all right. Well, uh, you don't need to have heard what I just said, I said. <laughs> anyway, we go to the economics. Uh, this, and I, uh, the way to understand Lincoln's economics is implementing the ha American system of, with the principles of Alexander Hamilton. And these, this is just a quick rundown of these. Um, and those you can find more of in the, uh, in my book. So wait a minute, why isn't the, okay, there we are. So this was very clear, his outlook in uh, his first campaign for the uh, state legislature. Uh, this was happening at the time that, Alex, that uh, Andrew Jackson was directly out to dismantle the American system, especially the Bank of the United States. And Lincoln's point was, I'm for a national bank, internal improvements, that needs federal support for that, uh, and with federal credit and a high protective tariff. Uh, which meant support for industry and labor. So, and he emphasizes that kind of approach in his first address to Congress, the State of the Union at that point was not given in uh, January or February, but at the opening of Congress in December. Uh, expansion of uh, rail uh, infrastructure, and he emphasizes the, that his administration is putting a priority on serving the interests of labor. Uh, and you have this, I don't know how, how well-known this quote is, it's well-known among people that I knew, uh, but uh, this is his uh, outlook, which was particularly relevant in the fact that he was being squeezed by the New York banks uh, to try to uh, take a different policy than he was intending. Um, so uh, he then, but he had to assert, uh, he was basically being blackmailed by the New York banks and the New York banks were uh, beholden to the British banks um, and their way of, uh, of financing the war would have further indebted and uh, drained the United States to those, you know, to the British banks. So Lincoln decided we actually had to assert sovereignty over our currency. Um, and the first legislation to this effect was in 1862. He actually calls for it also in that first speech of 18, uh, uh, December, calling for uh, greenbacks as the as legal tender, meaning they have to be acceptable for to accepted on the full faith and credit of the federal government. Um, this was a uh, it's not used not possible for everything. Customs had to be paid uh, in specie and a couple other things, but uh, legal tend but it could be used for taxes for paying the troops and for paying for an industrial buildup, which was obviously necessary. Um, the argumentation for this by the father of the Greenback, who was a New York Congressman by the name of Albert Spalding, was that, uh, that the country had to have control of its currency. Uh, that's a Hamiltonian argument, sovereignty uh, over our currency, your currency. Uh, it can't be left in the hands of uh, money lenders. Uh, we can't go begging, handing to the bankers. Uh, the powers of the government were given for the welfare of the nation. That's uh, basically an echo of Hamilton's defense of the constitutionality of the National Bank. Uh, and this uh, is also necessary to prevent foreign intervention. Now, people thought, that uh, the greenbacks being paper money would fail. They did not fail. Uh, there was a certain amount of inflation for sure, but it was considered patriotic uh, to 
uh, honor them, uh, it was part of mobilizing the country to win the war. And, but it was not necessary because you still had a wild banking system. Uh, and when Lincoln took over, there were 8,000 different kinds of local currencies. Um, so, and the greenbacks were uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. They were not going to take over all of that. But the banking system was basically uh, a, a cutthroat operation. And that had to be uh, brought under regula federal regulation as it had been under the first and second, uh, you know, in a way parallel to what was done in the first and second uh, banks of the United States. So uh, Lincoln and Chase's secretary, his treasury secretary worked on the 1863 National Banking Act. And what many people don't realize is that, that the framework that was set up for that was is actually what we have today, uh, minus the Federal Reserve, of course, which is a whole different kettle of fish. But the um, this what was established to regulate the system was the Office of the Controller of the Currency. Um, and it had the power to chart charter a series of national banks, but those national banks had to be cap had to, in order to be able to issue currency to purchase a minimum number of treasury bonds. In other words, federal debt, federal became the capital for these national banks. That supported the debt, but it also supported circulation of, uh, of necessary credit throughout the economy. The controller regulated those banks, set capital standards, uh, supervised them, uh, and the result was a de facto national currency, uh, which uh, is what we need today. So that uh, did make the put credit into the economy for other, you know, uh, phases of the uh, mobilization for the war and for the mobilization of the economy as a whole. Lincoln was obviously looking to win the war. He knew that what was necessary to do that, however, was to have, was to at the same time work for the improvement of the uh, prospects for future prosperity for the nation. Uh, and that required growing the economy overall, not just the war part of the economy. So, uh, and it involved infrastructure to uh, accelerate national unity. And part of that, of course, the major project which he's well known for is the Pacific Rail Act uh, in a Hamiltonian fashion. He used government credit for that uh, with uh, land grants and government bonds. Um, that was extremely critical in not only bringing the country together, uh, but in incredibly increasing the productivity. Uh, and it ultimately raised a profit for the federal government. Um, despite all the corruption and so forth, which I'm, uh, is well known and uh, mostly discussed, uh, this was what actually, how it actually turned out in the bottom line. Um, he had a whole, this is all happening in the first half of 1862. Um, that in the midst of, a, of trying to fight a war, uh, these measures are being taken, which are not directly related to fighting the war, but to improving, to carrying out those purposes of improvement of the physical economy for the population. So one of those things is the establishment of the Department of Agriculture, uh, which he felt was important to provide the latest science uh, to farm, make the latest science available to farmers, uh, make credit available for improvement of their 
ability to produce. Um, one of the things that he really was emphasizing, uh, he did this in this Wisconsin speech I mentioned before, was the expansion of steam power. Um, uh, steam tractors, uh, because he believed that the country could be a lot more productive in agriculture than it was. Uh, and through his tenure, it actually became so. Then there was, in the summer, the Land Grant College Act. Uh, talked about education, the commitment to education before. This is connected to the desire to improve the efficiency of farming, but not just. Uh, because it was not going to, it was dedicated to the mechanical arts plus, you know, the, not only the mechanical arts. And again, um, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, the backing for this came from federal credit. Uh, and you can see it, there was a point made of the fact that every state uh, would get a grant of this sort to be able to set up such a college um, or university. And you see that we have some major, these institutions became major uh, institutions to the present day. Uh, these were the provisions of the act, 30,000 acres of public land. Uh, those who didn't have that got uh, an arrangement. The land had to be sold and the proceeds used uh, to be able to get the, uh, get the college going. Now, uh, the result of this was a major uh, boost in productivity uh, in those areas which the union controlled. Um, there was a major increase in not only output, but the quality of output, uh, the inputs to education in, of the labor force um, and, uh, and the agricultural sector. And this is Lincoln uh, in 1865. I think the last photograph taken of him um, that uh, just to conclude with that, you know, the discussion on the economic aspect of it is in my book on Hamilton. It has a chapter that discusses how Hamilton's concept of uh, economic principles were carried forward by John Quincy Adams, Lincoln, and FDR, and uh, the Lincoln chapter is called Abraham Lincoln Hamiltonian. And if you want to talk with me, uh, follow my blog or any other uh, follow up after this discussion, this is the way you can do it. I am readily accessible. And that is what I'm going to, where I'm going to stop. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Uh, now we're going to go into our question and answer period. Let's thank our speaker with a round of applause, everybody. Can you hear that, Nancy? I hear that. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let's get into our question and answer period now. Uh, we'll first entertain a couple. Uh, you go ahead. You want to answer a question and we'll hand you the mic and we'll get you on. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Jean Boudar, and I wanted to know if you would explore the um, something I heard that the British were really concerned about the fact that Lincoln was so intent on keeping the uh, Union together because um, he he viewed this as um, a, a way for the United States oh, to, to dominate. Uh, to dominate um, world commerce. And um, he didn't want it to split up because then we would be a, a, a few small nations instead of one big powerful nation. Leave it alone. Trade, wait, 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 wait. International trade. Wait, what did they do? 
I, I'm not sure I understood. I mean, the British were the were no, the power no, of the wait. world. No, they, wait, wait. Excuse uh, me. No, that was that. I had to mute somebody. That's all. Go ahead. Um, you know, the British uh, wanted to continue to be the world empire they were. They did not want to be challenged by any independent nations. They wanted, they were the work to be the workshop of the world, right? Um, and therefore, uh, indeed, they were very much against uh, the industrialization push. And part of that was that this incredible dependence that the South had on Great Britain in terms of financing the expansion of slavery. 80% of the cotton was exported to Great Britain. I mean, you hear about this being uh, to the North now, the Northern bankers were definitely involved. They were intermediaries and they also made money, but the major uh, beneficiaries were in Great Britain. Uh, and they were interested in that. There was a very interesting thing. There's a there's a, um, um, a post on my blog um, because there used to be, it's now been dissolved, I think, a foundation connected to the, to the uh, US Navy, US Navy history, collecting documents on, on uh, what was uh, on the history of the Navy. Um, and they, I was looking up the, Russian intervention in favor of the Union in, when they sent their fleet over here in 1864 uh, to back up uh, the Union. And what this Navy related grouping said is the, the only European power that was not hostile to Lincoln's uh, defense of the Union was Russia, the only one. You know, the French wanted to see it. The British were highly, it said explicitly, the British wanted to see the country weakened. They wanted to see it broken up. Okay. And, uh, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Lana. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Can you show us yourself, Lana, on the video? Uh, no, no, I prefer not. Uh, it's okay, everything okay. Um, kind of shy. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, my question, first of all, thank you so much for uh, your speech. It's incredible. <laughs> very, very nice. Anyway, I might, not anyway, it's true. <laughs> thank you. My question is, um, <clears throat> any economical connection was during the Lincoln time, you know, when um, uh, economy here in this country was developed in uh, 19th century. Any connection was, do you know, with really Russian economics and development in Russia somewhere? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I wait for answer right now. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, you know, I can refer you to um, you know, forgive me if I push my book, you know. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it, it, it has a great program to do. It, it, has a, it has a section uh, about the spread of uh, Hamilton's ideas. Um, mm -hmm. The Russians were the first mm -hmm. to uh, translate the report on manufacturers mm -hmm. of Hamilton. They mm -hmm. had it translated into Russian by 1807. Mm -hmm. That's the earliest translation that I'm aware of <clears throat> into a foreign language. Obviously, it didn't get very far for a long, long time. But, you know, after, you know, in the period that we're talking about this, well, in the early, in the 1840s, uh, members of the U.S. Corps of Engineers were sometimes seconded to Russia to help build the rail network. And later on, the... Uh, there was uh, Cassius Clay, who was uh, Lincoln's uh, ambassador to Russia, mm -hmm. was uh, no relation to Muhammad Ali, but you know, uh, <laughs> was uh, a was promoting 
uh, mm -hmm. the American system over there. <coughs> and, uh, a lot of the ideas of, of the American uh, economic method of Alexander Hamilton were promoted there through a German uh -huh. uh, uh, subscriber to that system, Friedrich List. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Hamilton, he yes. was uh, America, uh, from America or from England? He was Scottish, Hamilton, or from here, or from here, or state? Uh, Hamilton was, a uh, father was uh, Scottish, but he was born in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born in islands of the, uh, an island of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and then came to New York. Um, All right. Okay. Charlie's got the next question, and then we'll go to someone in here. Go ahead, Charlie. Yes, Nancy. Uh, I would think that the you claim credit for the Homestead Act as being Hamiltonian economics, but setting up independent farms and the Department of Agriculture Act isn't that Jeffersonian economics? No. Uh, well, I, I didn't want an independent I didn't... of farms. I, I didn't talk about uh, the Homestead Act in particular, but, but Hamilton was not anti-agriculture and nor was, uh, nor was uh, uh, obviously Lincoln, because uh, if you read the report on manufacturers or just read the review of it in my book, the, his whole point was it's not industrial industry versus agriculture, it's putting the two of them together. The mechanization of, of uh, in manufacturing provides a a, a market for for agriculture. It improves the productivity of agriculture by mechanization and the and, and the innovations that carry out there. It's all one country, so it's not a uh, it's not a conflict. Uh, what it is a conflict is if your agriculture is run according to a slave system. That is a conflict uh, because that's really a, a feudal system, even though it uses, as many people emphasize, it uses so-called capitalist methods. It's a feudal system. Uh, okay, Nancy, we got another one here online now. Go ahead. My question, uh, you said that Lincoln never wavered in his opposition to slavery. Uh, I was wondering, to, to, your, to your knowledge, um, was the Fugitive Slave Act ever enforced under Lincoln? Did he do anything to try to stop it? And another part of the question, did Lincoln ever consider a proposal to pay slave owners um, for the takings of their slaves? I'm not sure I got all the questions. I didn't say... <sighs> I mean, what I said about the policy on slavery was that he always thought it was wrong. He thought it should be on the road to extinction as it was at the beginning, but he didn't challenge its ability to exist in the original Southern states where it was um, until it came to the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and he, so he he was a law, you know, he made a big point to the South that he would obey the law until he could change the law by peaceful means. Now that never happened because the war happened. Uh, and therefore there was, it was, did not happen through peaceful means. But the, uh, as far as I know, uh, the, uh, the opposite happened during the war. The slaves were not returned. They were, when they fled to the Union lines, they were accepted. Um, they weren't, they, their treatment was varied uh, quite radically from general to general. But the, uh, that was- uh, All right, Nancy, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to ask you to compress your answers a little bit more because we have, do have a few more questioners. Okay, I'll be shorter. And then I'm, I'm, go ahead, go ahead. And she was there before, but go ahead. And then we got another one. Go ahead. No, she, we could see her. Uh, I understood that Lincoln definitely offered to buy the slaves in order to avoid war, and the South refused. 
No, I don't believe that. I, I haven't seen that. What he did. Should I go? Uh, Nancy, where did do is say there was a constant the interregnum between his election and his inauguration, um, which was, uh, I think, signed by Buchanan, but uh, I'm not absolutely sure of that. And that would have uh, made it said that slavery could continue to exist in the Southern states without interference of the federal government. Um, and he said that he would go along with that for whatever reason, but the South refused that because the slave system involved expansion. <laughs> they believed that they could not, and given the way that they treated the land and everything else, the objective of the of those running the slave system here in the country and internationally was to expand it. It was a never ending, it, it eats its people, right? Slavery eats its people and it eats its land and it has to expand, it has to find other places to uh, absorb. Um, so, uh, so there were, and he also made a proposal at the end of 1862, where uh, for a long-term plan that would get rid of slavery uh, over, uh, you know, over decade, uh, you know, three decades that, to end the war. And that was rejected by the South. Uh, We've got another question here, Nancy, if you don't mind. Go sure. ahead. Another question. Go ahead. Nancy, yeah, I'd like to ask you, what do you think Lincoln's relationship was with the city of Chicago? Um, today I heard that he gave a speech uh, on the north side. I understand he stood, stayed at. Can you speak up, please? So yeah, I can sure. Better. Can you hear me now? A little better. Is it, how about now? Shout at me, okay? <laughs> uh, how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you about Lincoln's relationship with the city of Chicago. Um, I've always been curious about why Mary Todd Lincoln came here after his death and stayed here for a while. I've heard that Lincoln stayed at the Tremont Hotel downtown. Today I heard he gave a speech on the north side. We don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if he made money here at the courthouse. Can you give us a sense of his relationship with the city uh, since we're here tonight? I'm afraid you've got me stumped on that one, sir. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I confess I'm sort of a policy person. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I tend to focus on that, although, uh, so I really don't know what I, what I know about Chicago had to do with having the convention, the presidential convention there, uh, which obviously, and the fact that, that that convention was held there, that there were movers and shakers who were long-term allies of Lincoln in the legislature and so forth, who were able to mobilize a lot of people behind him, uh, that, you know, that obviously would have made Chicago very dear to his heart. <laughs> um, and perhaps also uh, to Mary Todd Lincoln's heart, because, uh, you know, contrary to what many people have said, Mary Todd was sympathetic with his anti-slavery view from the very beginning. Um, and uh, I've heard stories of her after his death going uh, around and, and providing aid to freed uh, former slaves and so forth. But um, all right, we got two okay. more. We got two more questions. Okay. Right. Yes, I. Um, I guess my question is uh, one. It's kind of a two parts. You know, I'm from in the South. We always heard that the war was fought over states' rights, not slavery. 
I don't know how common that was around other places. Very common. Right. And it, um, yeah. it I guess, and another, but there's also the theory that there's the, the reason he was killed maybe was the money, you know, the, um, that he was trying to nationalize everybody who brought the currency back to the United States rather than England um, was, would be assassinated. And, and then that's the other question. Sidney Blumenthal said he wrote a three part thing on, to, on Lincoln and he, he told me, but I don't think it made any of the three volumes that okay. I read that, that it was the Ku Klux Klan really put them up to the assassination. So it wasn't an individual act, okay. a lone wolf. It was actually a, um, and every president um, who tried to take the money back from like the Rothschild Bank, um, you know, the, would be, so the, the that's the question. Do you, do you know anything about that, the assassination? And um, you, I wonder what hypotheses you really looked for when you were writing this book. What drove you to okay, write it? Okay. Give it the okay, okay. That's three questions, really, I guess. Um, on the on the first one, in terms of states' rights, uh, well, in a way, it was states' rights, but the, what were the states' rights for? The states' rights were, were for to continue enslavement and to expand it. Uh, there was content to the slave to the states' rights. Um, and the uh, just as Lincoln's commitment to the Union was inextricably linked to the idea that slavery was wrong and had to be on the road to extinction, so the Southern uh, linkage to states' rights was, you know, intimately connected with the desire to maintain the slave system. So that's you know, the, there's content to these things, not just form. Um, secondly, on the assassination. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, I've read, I have not concentrated on this, but, uh, but I know that it was definitely a conspiracy. Um, there were not, it wasn't just a single man, which is why I'm a little bit circumspect with saying that Booth was, you know, inspired by hearing Lincoln say something about the vote, because, you know, I think the decision had been made far before before that to carry out the assassination. But, uh, but there was involvement all the way up the Confederacy, including uh, British, you know, the treasurer of the Confederacy, um, whose name now escapes me for the moment. He had, but he fled to Canada. Uh, a lot of the co-conspirators fled to Canada. Uh, they were in effect uh, sheltered by the British Empire. So um, one could make a case that the uh, that there were British authorities uh, that were very much interested in Lincoln's assassination. I mean, Lincoln was very popular with the working class in England, but he was not terribly. Uh, but he was lampooned mercilessly all the way uh, uh, through his political career by the British press, the official British press as an ape man, uneducated from the frontier, a creep, you know. Right. Next, we, have one more, we have one more question and then we're gonna to go to rebuttals. Don, you ready? Go okay. ahead and answer your question. Okay, can you hear me? All right, it's the same word. All right, uh, ma'am, I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, in your opinion, was Abraham Lincoln gay? I have no idea. All right, well, Okay, the reason I ask is that there are allegations right now, or I don't know if allegations are the right Well, word. so what? There is a theory right now that he was in fact homosexual and that, that Mary Todd was a uh, beard. I, I think it's irrelevant to the point, the, the policy points we're talking about. No, 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 no. She was he married her, he married her to, to uh, cover up the fact that he was gay. Oh, oh come what? on. He had a friend who was a I sergeant. I don't, see why it should, I don't really see why, why people should suddenly condemn Lincoln if he, if he was gay, but, but Okay, all right. I have a question. No, the, we, we're, we're closing down questions. You had one, Alana, already. Yeah, very quick. Gotta go to rebuttals now because you're starting. Okay, uh, to hey. I would like just to know, uh, can you introduce yourself kindly? Juliana, please. 
and where you're from and and thank you very well, much i just want you to give a little background but you want well, and nancy when you're done just give a little bit about of your background yeah when, yeah sure will do will do okay let's get the rebuttals now who's got the first rebuttal well, oh, oh, I don't get to say anything now, right? So what we're going to do is you're going to get the last word. Rebuttal. Okay. We're gonna, we're, now we're going to do rebuttal. So give it to Sid. Okay. All right. I'm going to allow everybody about three minutes. Oh, oh, the mic is off. I turned it off just because okay. I wouldn't, so that, so that we only record my words when I wanted it to. Here you, go. Okay, you got it. You said, can you said, this is working. Well, Lincoln had a theory about democracy and, uh, the theory he had is quite different from what we ever had in the United States. His idea of democracy was five, four, and both of by and for the people. And it was of by and for the people of the upper classes in the United States that controlled the government. And they didn't want the other part. So when we say we have democracy, it's very limited only to voting and even voting <coughs> like the electoral college. Wyoming has two people that go to the electoral college and California with about 36 million Two people. So how is that democracy? We never had we never had real democracy in the United States. And right now we're going through a period where there's a split in the ruling classes. And the split is between do we want to Will up the idea that the people had or used to have about the United States being a democracy, or do we want to go into fashion? And when you put on the television, they never talk about it. That the Republican Party is now a fascist party. Never. And they never talk about climate change. So they, I think, belong to the right wing of the fascist uh, party. Another thing is the oil. Fossil fuels are supporting <coughs> the fascists in the United States. There's no doubt about it. So right now, we're at a turning point. Are we going to go to fascism? Are we going to go to having the illusion of democracy? Well, I'm for the illusion as far as not going into fascism. But I want real democracy, not illusion. And we can only get that if people really ran the country, which we never had. Okay, Sid, your uh, time's about up. President. President. All right, now what we're gonna do to collect the three is we're gonna have Ricardo go around Here. and collect. If we got something. We're gonna have Ricardo go around and collect we got tonight. Three hours. All three hours. right, and then who wants to go next on the rebuttal? I do. All right, all right. Okay, then we're gonna get, uh, all right, hang on here, I gotta get, uh, uh, not, I'm not, uh, camera's got to be straightened out. Okay, we got you. All right, you want to hand us off to, uh, oh, no, I'm just, just hand it off to David. It'll, it'll work. David, right there. Go ahead. Three minutes. Thank you, sir. All right. First of all, with regard to the comments that Doug made, I got news for you. They tried every sick way that's one day in order to prevent a civil war. And the South said no. And that's why the first shot was fired by the South at Fort Sumter. Period, end of story. There was no pacifist way out. Period. The South made it plain that they wanted to fight. They were going to fight in order to tell their slavery, 
right word. Use please. the microphone, please. Sedition had to be crushed. Well, if what? Plain and simple. With regard to the comments that Don made, with regard to the comments that Don made about alleged homosexuality, that's due to the fact that one, when President Lincoln was around, there weren't apartment buildings for people to rent or buy apartments in Springfield and elsewhere. People had guys had to share rooms and often share beds because it just wasn't space to play everybody. And when lawyers travel on the circuit, so go ahead, just finish your comments. And we'll All right. All right, go ahead and finish, David. David, go ahead and finish. This is ridiculous. David, finish, finish your rebuttal. And when lawyers travel on the circuit, there weren't Holiday Inns or Howard Johnson's or whatever where the lawyers could stay at. So there were only these little country taverns, even in the county seats, where again the lawyers and some of the judges had to share rooms and share beds, plain and simple. The idea that President Lincoln was some kind of gay person because of all this is once again a lot of first shit plain and simple. Okay, who's next? Uh, please. All right. Okay. So, what, Calvin? You want to go? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Calvin. I'd like to say, um, like a lot of American historians, you tend to uh, gloss over the fact that uh, Britain was the first major power to abolish slavery a generation before the land of the free. Um, yes, did we have an ambiguous um, attitude towards the product of slavery? Well, yeah. But can you say that all, all the clothes in your wardrobe have not been produced, no, and none of the clothes in your wardrobe have been used by, uh, produced by a, a sweatshop or uh, Chinese political prisoners? Um, I doubt it. Uh, yes, this, I live in Liverpool, and Liverpool was one of the hubs of the slave trade. Um, you don't have to, you know, it takes, we, we are horrified by the trade when we look at the pictures of the ships, et cetera, et cetera, the, 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 the illustrations. Um, what you don't realize is the vast amount of money that was that was available to be major. You could commission a ship and receive a profit on first voyage. That's how, that's how much profit there was in the slave trade. And um, Britain was the first to abolish the slave, tra the slave trade in its lands. It was the first, it, not only that, the Royal Navy actively um, cleared the high seas, endeavoured to clear the high seas of the trade. And, and this was not in Britain's economic interest. Uh, it was, yeah, um, did, yeah, as, as to uh, Britain's view on, on the Civil War, I, can, I do thank the, the speaker for, for, for illumination. Britain, fund, Britain supplied arms to both sides, um, not, not, uh, not alone in that kind of situation. Um, that's all I'd like to say is a little bit more defence in there. We weren't, we weren't the, the villains on this. We were interested by, um, bystanders. Kelvin, so? you're done, right? Yeah. Okay, let's. Uh, who wants to rebut next? Oh, All right, Don, and then we'll go yeah. to. Okay, Don. Okay. You got you have him in the microphone, and. Yeah, uh, microphone, uh, oh no, we'll just just. All right. Uh, All right. Is this thing okay? Is this thing turned on? Yeah, yeah. it's turned All on. Right. All right. I just um I wanted to say in response to the gentleman who was just speaking that uh, it is certainly true that um that the British Empire abolished slavery. I believe it was in 1833 before the United States government abolished it with the 13th Amendment in 1865. However, individual states within the U.S. Uh, had abolished slavery long before the British Empire did. Uh, Vermont and all the north, northern states. See, see a, lot of, uh, a lot of Americans don't realize, a lot of people in the world don't realize that at the time the U.S. declared independence, 
1776. Slavery was legal in all 13 states. And, um, and it, that includes the states in you know, the northern states as well as the southern states. And then after the American Revolution, people started saying, hey, wait a second, if all men are created equal, why do we have slavery? And so, so a movement developed to, it was actually getting going even in colonial times. But, uh, but after the American Revolution, the abolition movement in the North kind of eventually kind of gathered enough force to get slavery abolished in the Northern states, uh, states uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, so, so we were actually, um, so, so, so our country, at least if you look at individual states, our country is way ahead on that. We're also ahead on votes for women because the first, the first place in the whole world to give women the vote was one of our states, Wyoming in 1869. And um, now, now the second thing I want to say is in response to what, what Ellen was talking about in terms of whether the Civil War was about state rights or whether it was about slavery. I mean, this is something you hear a lot about. Um, uh, you know, I, I've lived in both the North, and, I live in the North now, I live in Chicago, but I used to live in the South, I used to live in Tennessee. So I, you know, I've heard both sides of the controversy. And my answer is it was about both. I mean, first off, uh, the, the South kind of, I mean, the Confederate states kind of were fighting for states' rights. Uh, that is the right to secede from the United States and form their own country. However, then you get to the question, why did they secede? And I'll tell you the reason. Um, the first round of state, the first <laughs> So, uh, so uh, okay, somebody trying to stop me talking, probably a Confederate. You're talking. Yeah, and uh, and the, the the first seven states seceded because of Lincoln getting elected president, and and they were afraid. Oh crap! With a Republican president, the the, the the United States will abolish slavery now, and we don't want that to happen. We want to keep slavery legal. So so we're going to secede so we can have our own country. So slavery will remain legal. Um, then after after the fall of Fort Sumter, when the Civil War really got going. Um, and at the time of the at the time of the Battle of Fort Sumter, there was still only seven states in the Confederacy. The other four states joined in because at that point they had a choice: were they going to participate with the United States in suppressing the Confederacy, or would they join with the Confederacy? They, they, yeah, so they had to do one or the other, and they decided to side with the, with the Confederacy. So, uh, so ultimately, when you look at the original reason for secession, yeah, it was about slavery. All right, is my, is my time up? What, yes, oh, okay. Okay, who's party? next? Ellen's gonna go next. All right, Doug, go ahead. Okay, well, Don actually uh, brought up a point, which uh, uh, in response to the gentleman here, um, who uh, said that everything had been tried in order to uh, prevent the Civil War. Um, I disagree with that because uh, at the time Lincoln took uh, office, I think there were only four. I think it was the most five. Oh. And especially the most important state, the most populous uh, southern state had not. Teetering on, on the edge. Uh, there were only four. Um, and uh, Lincoln had a choice. He was actually confronted with a dilemma of whether to <coughs> um, with a ship. Would actually be considered a provocative act. Now, he was under no compulsion to send the ship in, which actually, he, but he expected that it would spur the South into firing the South, which would seem to put him in the uh, moral high ground. Uh, now, I, I would like people to consider this possibility that uh, had he implemented other measures, had he offered to sell the uh, fort. Sumter to the uh, South Carolinians. Had he offered to rent it to them for a period of years, four years perhaps, and it could be reconsidered by his successor after that as a as a conciliatory thing. Uh, there was no necessity to um, cause a shot to be fired. Uh, it could have taken place, of course, any not there were incendiary situations going on. But had Virginia stayed in the Union, which it almost certainly would have, as my, my friend Don pointed out, uh, these additional states uh, came in on the side of the South only after Lincoln actually called up volunteers. That was the real precipitating event that caused the extra states to secede. 
Maybe you could have marked them off one by one and maybe pared it down to maybe four or three southern states and eventually could have reconstituted the union without bloodshed. So we didn't really try hard enough. That's my proposal. And I could get go back in a time machine perhaps and try to replay it, but uh, we'll never know the actual okay. we'll never know the actual truth. Okay, let's uh all right, next uh, we got uh go ahead. Yeah. Okay, hi. Um okay. I Mike, here's my rebuttal that I in my college, the problem with our education system is that it usually stops at the Civil War and it doesn't go forward. And and so we you know find ourselves debating this. And that for me the frustration I've had with the college of complex is that we need to be talking about now the issues now and it, you know you can draw parallels and that's interesting um, but it you know uh, fascism versus democracy uh, you know the that's why I picked it up because I didn't understand it we never talked about it the fascism and I you can't understand any of this until you understand fascism, right? And the modern times, and and that explains. And then you go back, and everything makes sense. You can understand feudalism. You can understand, you know, the. It turns out my ancestors like traced it back. We thought it might be Robert E. Lee, but they came over in 1619, which Robert, which Martin Luther King wrote about, but. Um, you know, the first slave might have gone to the Wyatts, Francis Wyatt, my ancestor, and but also Pocahontas was there at the same time. Turns out I'm related to Pocahontas. And, you know, it's it's so neat because they the British kidnapped her and um, took her over there and got her son and um, maybe it poisoned her. <laughs> they, they just wanted to capture the princess and um, that way bring them back and make themselves king. But the Sid has told me this fascinating stuff about the Indian monarchy. The, this is the Marxist, right? A Marxist has written about the Indian culture and what this guy um, learned about, how he learned about that. But actually, I learned about my ancestor was Cleopatra, her sister, which her son came back 30 years later looking for her. So now I'm looking for her and I'm going to write that history. But there's always a reason, I think, <coughs> about the system. I was raised by a stepfather that was Ayn Rand and uh, Milton Friedman and Alan Grease. And he he had me a bunch across from my whole class. We had to debate, you know, was the South, was it about slavery or what? Um, it had to be fought over slavery. And, and I tried to defend his hypothesis that it was about air conditioning would have ended things anyhow. Uh, it's not easy, right? Uh, I feel uh, that nobody helped me with that at all. I and mean, you can laugh about it in hindsight, but this is the kind of argument he would make. You know, air conditioning would have taken care of it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, and here we are still dealing with things. I mean, should we be in Ukraine or, you know, as Russia had their attack and we've got to defend them? I am anti war. And that, um, I think Doug's asking a good question. And if it wasn't answered then, it should be answered now. We've got to look at America's part, or is it actually the effect that England had on America? And they've always, and I've, I've heard that the French saw helped as, um, was it the Civil War? Uh, yeah. And so, anyhow, uh, we have to talk about the here and now, mainly to stop war, stop slavery, and we got to get critical race theory back in the schools. I'm, let's volunteer this team to give a talk on that. Okay. Uh, who's next? All right. Uh, anybody here? I'm seeing nobody online. I'm going to keep going live. He is. He's having one right here. Okay. Uh, go ahead and stand up so we can see you. Well, we'll get you next, Charlie. I have a question during the Civil War. How many people, what was the percentage that went for the South, for the North, and how many were just want to be neutral? Yeah, good one. Oh, you could and find maybe that. Maybe even fled to Canada. Oh. That would be neat, nice yeah. to know. We can Google it and find out. I All right, uh, <laughs> Charlie, you're, you're, you're next. Charlie Paydock. Yeah, I uh, 
I want to thank Nancy for her presentation. It's a, the economic policies of the period aren't, aren't very often covered. Uh, however, I must raise issue of one topic of which I'm familiar with, and that's the building, the construction of the transcontinental railroad. And I'm uncertain regarding this. The government of the United States uh, effectively built a railroad uh, at, and the railroads profited, private sector companies profited significantly as a result of that. And your slide, the one slide you have on that, I, I, I really got to question. Later on, this became, as you are well aware, an issue in presidential politics that in fact, the government of the United States had given away our wealth uh, to private sector companies. And you focus on, uh, they were rewarded not only in extensive land grants, land that they were sell and capitalize on, as well as rewarded financially for each mile completed. Uh, this is, Perhaps is this Hamiltonian economics or is this, or is this Keynesian economics? Um, but I'm not alone that, that where issues were raised that the government of the United States had, had, had perhaps been uh, taken for a ride regarding this. You focus, of course, on the uh, unification of the country However, the, and the railroads also would never have built a railroad into a territory like that. You, you build a railroad to connect existing municipal locations, cities. And this was constructing a railroad into total and absolute vacant territory. Um, I mean, one could say, well, would it have been done without the government? It certainly would never have been done by the private sector by and of themselves. No one builds a railroad that doesn't go anywhere, which is what there, those cities did not exist for thousands of miles. Anyhow, that's the only thing to think about. I hadn't really considered it myself. I don't really have the depth of background in economics, but uh, those are the issues that I raised and others have raised it prior to me that, uh, that have questioned uh, Lincoln's domestic policy regarding uh, internal improvements. Thank you very much though. Come again when you have another one. Okay, uh, Andy, you, you, Andy, you got one. It's gonna have to be our last rebuttal. All right. Well, we'll do two of them, but we'll keep it uh, keep it under three minutes. So I'm going to. It might be better so they can see a little easier. Come on up. And, yeah, th roughly three minutes. I, I got a, I got a time here, so go ahead. Yeah, that's fine, Andy. We we we're we're all set, and I got a three minute okay. clock ready to go. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'd like to uh, reinforce what two of our people said here tonight. Um, I think Sid was talking about, uh, nobody's really talking about climate change, right? That's one of the major, major, major problems facing humanity. And mm -hmm. there's a website called Americans Who Tell the Truth. There's 65, 260 portraits there. Lincoln is one of them. Uh, famous people that have dedicated their lives to freedom and justice, fairness, and ending slavery. David Ray Griffin is on there. He passed away in November. He wrote 14 books on the mythology of 9-11. 9-11 is the key to a lot of things that are happening with police brutality and everything else because our military on 9-11, right after that, they passed the Patriot Act that says no citizen that's not a billionaire with its own private army has any rights at all. It can be arrested, disappeared, without a phone call anywhere. So... The police have been militarized all over the country, and they have uh, 
they think they have freedom just to uh, cut down black people or wherever they see it uh, because lynching became illegal in 1965. You can't lynch people, no, no more people hanging in trees. So now we have these lynchings by cop and it's gotta stop. And we have to talk about it in those terms. And as far as promoting peace and justice, we have to realize that we have a billionaire predator problem that owns our military industrial complex. And they keep wars, permanent wars going to make 10 times more profit per ton of whatever they sell than what they sell in peacetime. All right, I'm, I'm a Vietnam veteran. That's why I wore my hat tonight. I, I found out we have not been in any just war helping people anywhere since Vietnam. Vietnam was a controlled operation for the military to make money, and it was all about oil and resources. So if we're going to have any chance that the kids that are little now growing up on a planet that's livable by 2060, they're talking about some coastal city being sort of underwater with hurricanes flooding them out every year. Even if the sea level doesn't come up, Miami and uh, the coastal cities around the world are going to be unlivable on this planet by 2060. That's, that's a consensus of hundreds of thousands of science. There's no question about it. So I, I think knowing the history of what uh, Lincoln believed in, if we take those values forward and, and apply those values to problems we have today, we can make a lot of progress. Okay. Yeah, all right. We got we got one more way butter left. Come on up and uh, we'll give you three minutes. Good good job, Andy. Good job. Okay. Uh, How many people have been arrested under the Patriot Act? Uh, uh, Charlie, shut up. We got one more rebuttal. Zero. Charlie, shut up. Not one person. Time, Charlie. All right. Hi, how you doing? My name is Angel. Um, I just wanted to ask something on that. Slavery is not over because we are all still slaves. We got to get up in the morning, go to work, and you know we have all this stress towards us. You know we pay taxes, which is in reality legal extortion. That is that is unnecessary. So slavery is not over. You know, and we forgot that. The loss of nature. We are the guardians of the earth. There should be no wars. Wars create profit for the elites, the one percent that controls the rest of all of us. So that there should be no war, no no. It's quality, justice, peace, and union between all of us. That's the way I think that we we can you know destroy all the slavery, this rat race that we're in. You know. So thank you very much, and I hope you take that into consideration. And for, don't forget that the uh, uh, federal reserves are owned by private institutions. It's a private institution, and these people, you know, uh, the elites are in control of it. So why just take that into consideration and, and think about it? You know, yeah. this, this we're all slaves. The rat race, is, the rat race, still going. We're all slaves without even knowing it. Okay, and taxes is legal extortion. Thank you very much. All right, uh, all right, I just ended here. Go ahead, you're, 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 tell, tell, tell Nancy to talk everybody. All right, first of all, let's thank our speaker, Nancy Spanhouse, for the wonderful job that she did. Okay, great. All right, next week, we are going to have Charlie Paddock, our coordinator, who's going to talk about Robin Hood. We gotta get Nancy the last word. All right, now Nancy, you get the last word. The last word. Final comments, Nancy. You got about uh, six minutes or so. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I I probably should have prepared a speech or something, um, which I haven't done. All you gotta do is just introduce yourself, promote your website, and it's good. Yeah, news. yeah. Well, I put in the I put in the chat my email and the and the blog, um, the uh, you know, and I and I also recommend you'll find on the blog ways that you can get the book. Um, but what I really want to do, and I think is so important, is to have you read Abraham Lincoln. Um, 
I know that it made a big difference for me. And now, of course, I've always liked Abraham Lincoln, right? But as a political figure, um, but I, and I've now taught a couple classes on him. And what I found particularly effective was to have people read some of these speeches because it opens their eyes to a depth of thinking strategically and philosophically uh, as well as politically that they just had no idea that a president of the United States uh, would do. Um, and it will give you a different view of what he was about. Um, the, you know, the, uh, this particular speech in 1838 on the preservation of our institutions is a totally modern speech. It speaks to today. He's speaking about the separation of the country through violence, one faction against another. How are you going to pull? How are you going to pull the country together uh, around a higher idea? It's absolutely modern. <laughs> um, the question of people being able to think through solutions to problems, the problem of education, an absolutely modern. Uh, question for all of us. Um, and then the, the motivation, the human motivation of this man. There's one story that I like to tell because I, because I do believe that, that the character of a political leader makes a very big difference. And uh, the, and it's a story that appears in Doris Kearns Goodwin's book. Uh, about Lincoln. Lincoln used to spend time at this sum, summer cottage, which some of you may be aware of. It's a now um, veterans home in Washington, DC. It's a certain, on a high ground, distant from the White House and the, uh, wasn't really a cottage. It was a pretty big operation, but, you know, he would go there and stay there to, to think and to work on pap state papers and to, I guess, relax or uh, try to um, during the course of his presidency. And one time, I don't remember exactly what year it was, in the course of the war, uh, a, cap uh, a military man, I don't know what his rank was, uh, showed up at his door while he was there. And this man said, uh, you know, knocked on the door and uh, told Lincoln, I want you to help me. My wife has been drowned in a uh, accident at sea. I want to recover her body and be able to give her a proper burial. And according to Doris Kearns Goodwin, Lincoln erupted in rage saying, what are you bothering me for with something like this? You know, here I am with the weight of the world on my shoulders, you know, trying to, can I have a little rest? Can I get out of, out of this? Um, and the, uh, so the guy left, you know, went back to DC, went back to his hotel. Um, what happened is that the next day, the guy is in DC in his room and he gets a knock on the door and it's the president of the United States saying, I acted like an ass, um, how can I help you? Now I want you to think about the character of a man who would do that. Well, think, I mean, he's legendary for his sympathy with the soldiers, you know, commuting people from death, you know, were being killed for mutiny and so forth, and or not mutiny, desertion and stuff like that. Um, but this is this is a character question, and it goes together with the policy question. You can't separate the fact of what he was trying to do with his economic policy, with his war policy, with his education policy, from that kind of understanding of what his values were. 
Okay, Nancy, we're gonna have to wrap it up soon, okay? But thank you very much. We got about maybe three minutes. I wanna get David to close us out. We wanna thank you very much. Stay on board because- uh, Nancy, can you really an, excuse me, please? Can you introduce yourself more? Because I pick up computer a little bit later. Can you tell me where you're broadcasting and- uh, The website's in the chat. Because speech- Yeah, yeah you go, go to American yes. System now and look up my biography, it's there. I'm not, uh, I'm not really, uh, you know, uh, erudite on, on why can you tell about yourself a little bit? Uh, what's your name? Full okay, name? Lana, we got to get going, okay? So I'm going to have David. No, oh, wait a minute. Lana. You know, it's not, it's Here, again, it's, it's rude, Lana, you know? Yeah. Lana, we got we to gotta close out, okay? All right. Uh, David, what's your occupation? I was an editor. Oh, okay. Find the collective works of Abraham Lincoln that uh, you have sent at your local library and bookstore. Visit them. In the words of CBS, they'll be happy to let you read more about it. All right. I want to thank all of you for coming. And as I said, next week's program, Charlie Payock is going to talk about Robin Hood. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. This concludes the College of Complexes.